Today is the fifth Sunday in ordinary time. Although God created everything good ab initio, the whole of creation has been groaning in labor pains from the moment of the fall of our first parents, Adam and Eve. From then onward, as we read in Romans 8, 19 to 20, creation has been waiting with eagerness for the manifestation of the children of God. It is through the manifestation of the children of God that creation will experience freedom from its slavery to corruption and brought into the same glorious freedom of the children of God. This implies that the world needs God's children for it to be a better place. Hence, our theme for today's reflection is Christians as Transformers of the World. The transformation of the world begins with our personal transformation into a godly people. We become a godly people when we refuse to conform to the pattern of this sinful world but offer our bodies as a living and dedicated sacrifice acceptable to God. Romans 12, 1-2 With our total dedication to God, we become shining lights in a darkened world as we shall read from the first reading, the psalm and the gospel. And since the light that radiates in our lives comes from God, it becomes a demonstration of the spirit and power of God to others, leading them to put their faith in God and not in man, as we shall hear from the second reading. The first reading is from Isaiah chapter 58, verses 7 to 10. Isaiah 58 is a post-exilic prophecy that insists on the need for inward religion rather than outward observance of religion. In this chapter, the key religious practice is fasting. Fasting is a deliberate and often prolonged abstinence from food and sometimes drink. This practice often lends an air of extra dedication to religious acts such as prayer, especially of repentance on the Day of Atonement. In the post-exilic period, fasting was used as a means of prayer, a means of calling on God's direct assistance when the community was in great danger. See Ezra 8.21-22, Esther 4.15-16, and Daniel 9.3. As God says in Isaiah 58.2, My people seek for me day by after day. They long to know my ways like a nation that has acted uprightly and not forsaken the law of its God. But God says in verse 1, Shout for all you are what? Raise your voice like a trumpet. That is to say, God will not listen to them. And since God refused to listen to the people, They complained in verse 3, Why have we fasted if you do not see? Why mortify ourselves if you never notice? In response, God reminds his people that they engage in these religious practices for selfish reasons and not really transform their lives to conform to God's laws. Our reading for today thus gives us the clue on how to win God's attention and favor. God will pay attention to us if we, on us, part, pay attention to others. By feeding the hungry, sheltering the oppressed and homeless, and clothing the naked, etc. According to Jesus in Matthew 25, an act of kindness to the downtrodden and needy is an act of kindness to him who is our Savior and God. Our first reading reading tells us that our light will burn brightly if we do good to others. If we commit ourselves to the transformation of our world by caring for the well-being of others, especially the weak and the downtrodden, the hungry and the dejected, we shall enjoy divine favors of healing, vindication and glory. God says, then you shall call and the Lord will answer. To transform our world, therefore, we ought to remove from our midst oppression, false accusation and malicious speech. Remember, the just man is a light in darkness. In the second reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 2, verses 1 to 5, Paul offers a summary of how he preached, what he preached, and why he preached. 
he makes clear to the Corinthians his manner of preaching in verses 1 and 3 to 4, where he emphasizes the role of the power of the Spirit and of God, and he emphasizes the role of his own ability and skills of communication. As we read in verse 1, When I came to you, I did not come preaching the mystery of God according to excellence of speech or sophistry. The word for sophistry, Sophia in Greek, also means wisdom. But when used pejoratively, especially with reference to Greek wisdom or philosophy in contradistinction with divine mystery or revelation, it connotes the use of manipulative oratorical ability, hence sophistry. Paul reiterates in verses 3 to 4 the fact that the manner of his preaching is not according to sophistry or any personal communicative ability. I came to you in weakness, fear, and much trembling, he writes. My speech and preaching were not in the persuasiveness of sophistry, but in demonstration of spirit and power. The expression spirit and power in Greek, pneumatos kai dynamios, means power of the spirit. As to the content or what of Paul's preaching, he underscores not choosing and picking what to preach about, but the crucified Christ. As we read in verse 2, I did not decide what to make known among you. Only Jesus Christ, the one who was crucified. Finally, in verse 5, Paul makes clear why he preached the crucified Christ in the manner he did. Namely, in order that your faith may not be in human wisdom, but in the power of God. The questions for us today to reflect on, therefore, are... In your speech or action, what do you proclaim? What do you preach? How do you preach? And why do you preach? Do you preach the crucified Christ or something else? Are you guided by the power of the Spirit and of God in your preaching? Or you merely employ sophistry and manipulative communicative skills? Does your preaching inspire faith in you? in the people themselves, in any human wisdom whatsoever, or in the power of God. Our gospel today follows immediately after the Beatitudes we heard last Sunday. The Beatitudes are practiced in this world, not in heaven, but with a view to gaining eternal life. And so Jesus immediately followed the Beatitudes with the teaching of how to live them out using the analogies of salt and light, which are very familiar to us. The listeners of Jesus knew the properties of salt and light very well. Israel's proximity to the Dead Sea and many salt pits made salt a readily accessible commodity. If you read Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 9, salt was valued for many reasons. It's flavoring. Without salt, the food is tasteless. If you read Job chapter 6, verse 6, it's also known for its preservative power. When rubbed on meat, for instance, it slows decay. Salt was also used for healing, especially for newborn babies, as we read in Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 4, 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 21. For liturgical functions, if you read Leviticus chapter 2, verse 13, Ezekiel 43, verse 24, we add salt to water when blessing water as Elisha poured salt in the sea to purify it and bring about healing in 2 Kings chapter 2, 20 to 21. Salt was also used for covenant making. If you read Numbers chapter 18, verse 19 and 2 Chronicles chapter 13, verse 5, salt is scattered on the roads in snowy climates to lower the freezing temperature of water, thereby preventing ice and frost from forming on the roads. So you see, salt has so many functions. If the disciples lose their taste and flavor in the world, they become irrelevant, discarded, and undermined by people. Their presence must bring healing and blessing to people. Jesus then said to his disciples, you are the light of the world. 
a city built on a hilltop cannot be hidden. Light shines, dispels darkness, and helps people find their way. Just as a city on a hilltop cannot be hidden and a lamp cannot be put under a basket, so the followers of Jesus, wherever they are, must shine out through their virtues for everyone to see. Jesus employs these two common elements to demonstrate how his followers should live their lives. Both elements are meant to be felt and seen, not necessarily heard. Salt diffuses into water or food. It is not seen, but felt. It gives taste and flavor. The effects of the followers of Jesus must be felt in the world, even when they are not visible. Their legacies and impact must reflect in people's lives. While salt operates eternally, light on the other hand operates externally, radiating and shining for everyone to see. As followers of Jesus, we must possess both qualities of salt and light. We must not be loud in what we do, yet our presence must give light, hope and direction to people. Our good works must reflect the light of Christ and that is what draws people to God. When people see the life of Christians, they are transformed and give glory to God for the kind of people God has brought their way. The Devar Adonai team thanks you for listening and may Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. To follow our reflections for Sundays and solemnities, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or follow our Facebook page Devar Adonai or visit our website devaradonai.org.